Good morning, and welcome to our online service from Seaford Baptist Church. If you don't already know, I'm delighted to tell you that the church is now open for worship services, one at 9.30 in the morning, which is designed specifically for families, and another one at 11 o'clock, which is what we might call a more normal service. If you're able to come, we'd be delighted to see you. And now, shall we pray together as we start? Dear God, we come today to offer you our praise and worship and to thank you for all the many good things that we have, even in these times which are difficult for so many people. We are indeed so grateful for the privilege of living here, surrounded by the beauty of your creation. We pray that you will keep us always mindful of our responsibilities towards your creation and your people. And today, may we all take away from this service something which brings us nearer to you. For Jesus' sake, amen.
the splendor of the king. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God. The Lord will see how great, how great. From age to age he stands And time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son the lion and the lamb, the lion and the lamb. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. I'm reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 1 to 21, and I'm using the Good News Bible. Not long afterwards, another large crowd came together. When the people had nothing left to eat, Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I feel sorry for these people because they have been with me for three days and now have nothing to eat. If I send them home without feeding them, they will faint as they go, because some of them have come a long way. His disciples asked him, Where in this desert can anyone find enough food to feed all these people? How much bread have you got? Jesus asked. Seven loaves, they answered. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, gave thanks to God, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the crowd, and the disciples did so. They also had a few small fish. Jesus gave thanks for these and told the disciples to distribute them too. Everybody ate and had enough. There were about 4,000 people. Then the disciples took up seven baskets full of pieces left over, 
Jesus sent the people away and at once got into a boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. Some Pharisees came to Jesus and started to argue with him. They wanted to trap him, so they asked him to perform a miracle to show that God approved of him. <sighs> but Jesus gave a deep groan and said, Why do the people of this day ask for a miracle? No, I tell you, no such proof will be given to these people. He left them, got back into the boat, and started across to the other side of the lake. The disciples had forgotten to bring enough bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. Take care, Jesus warned them, and be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They started discussing among themselves. He says this because we haven't any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he asked them, why are you discussing about not having any bread? Don't you know or understand yet? Are your minds so dull? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 people? How many baskets full of leftover pieces did you take up? Twelve, they answered. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000 people, asked Jesus, how many baskets full of leftover pieces did you take up? Seven, they answered. And you still don't understand? He asked them. As this story opens, what's the first thing Jesus says? I feel sorry for these people because they're hungry. Now this is an essential pointer to, what, to who Jesus is and therefore to what or who God is because Jesus is where we meet God. Jesus is concerned about the ordinary things in our lives and he says, God will look after these things. You might remember in Matthew chapter 6, there's the, the phrase, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll wear. Do you think God won't look after these things for you? Now the trouble is, of course, I can hear somebody saying, you try telling that to somebody who's starving and homeless in Yemen or Syria. And this is a very valid point. Until we remember that we are God's agents. It's our job to be vigilant and attend to the issues like hunger which present themselves in the world. Forgive me for repeating myself, but I'm going to tell you again just how affected I was when we did the Millennium Mystery Plays at St. Leonard's. And if you remember the scene of the Last Judgment, where Jesus divides the people up, the sheep and the goats. And think back, what was the sequence of the conversation? Whenever did we see you, that's Jesus, a stranger, or welcome you in our homes, or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And Jesus answered, Whenever you did this for one of the least important of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. We have an enormous responsibility here. We are God's hands now, and we are his checkbook. But to get back to the main part of the story, which is the feeding of the 4,000, you might say there's an element of deja vu here, because we've just had the feeding of the 5,000. And indeed, there are many similarities, but also very important differences. The feeding of the 5,000 took place at Bethsaida. Now, that's on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, fairly near to Capernaum, and it's Jewish territory. Now, I have to be honest, I personally struggle to believe that there were exactly 5,000 people there. But biblical numbers have a very special significance that we don't always realize. And five 
is a very important number for the Jews. And if you remember this story, it, this happened in Jewish territory. Five is the number of books in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. There were five loaves available. Then, after the feeding, how many baskets of food were collected up? Twelve. Twelve is another very important number for the Jews. There were twelve tribes of Israel. So the feeding of the 5,000 was specifically a message to the Jews. God, through Jesus, had fed their needs, both physical and spiritual. Now the feeding of the 4,000 takes place in a different place, in the Decapolis, which is an area to the east of Galilee and the Jordan. Gentile country with a very strong Greek and Roman culture. But again, the numbers are significant. There were seven loaves and then seven baskets of leftovers. Seven was the number of completeness. It had a very special significance. For example, the creation took place in seven days. The feeding of the 4,000 is only recorded in two of the Gospels. It's a message to the Gentiles that everything Jesus stood for and said was for them as well as the Jews. The bread of heaven message is for Jew and Gentile alike. And this is especially reassuring for Mark's largely Roman audience. After the narrative of the feeding of the 4,000, the Pharisees arrived, demanding a miracle to prove that Jesus is God-connected. Jesus gives them very short shrift. It's probably the equivalent of our not likely today. No such proof will be given to these people. Well, we might say, why ever not? It would just be so easy to do something flashy and prove who you were. Get the whole business over and done with. It's similar to the temptations in the desert, if you remember, when Jesus was told to throw himself into the air so the angels would come and rescue him. And then, too, he refused. Why? Well, it's a bit like me trying to prove to you that a certain piece of music is particularly exquisite. I may believe so, but there's no proof. I can't do anything to make you think so. And I believe similarly, God doesn't want to browbeat us into faith and conviction. He doesn't want to do something flashy to prove it to us. He wants us to come of our own volition, freely choosing to be his followers, because in our hearts, that's what we really want. God wants changed hearts and minds. Next thing that happens is the disciples realize they've only got one loaf with them. And I must admit, I did think, what happened to all the leftovers in the seven baskets? But maybe we shouldn't go there. But this gives Jesus an opportunity to talk about leaven or yeast. He tells his disciples to be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, it sounds a bit odd to us, doesn't it? But in the Bible, yeast, leaven, is almost always associated with something evil. And in Jewish homes, there's no yeast around as they prepare for the Pas Passover. The point about yeast or leaven is that a little goes a very long way. Anybody who makes bread knows that you get a tiny teaspoon of yeast, mix it into the dough, and the whole thing expands enormously. It doubles in size. So when Jesus is talking about the leaven of the Pharisees, or the yeast of the Pharisees, he's referring to their hypocrisy. They're outwardly perfect, Lord-abiding people. But inside there's this little thing which is riddling their lives with corruption and scheming. Just like the disciples, we need to be aware of little things. Could be hard-heartedness, could be jealousy, could be envy, anything which can taint our whole lives and spoil our Christian experience and witness. 
This conversation ends in the text with the disciples explaining Jesus' comments to them with the words, he's saying this because we haven't got enough bread. And this is enough to trigger what I consider one of Jesus' outbursts. He basically upbraids them. Don't you understand? Do you still not get it? Are you stupid? Open your eyes. Open your ears. Haven't you seen and heard? Now that probably seems a bit harsh to us, but there are a number of factors at play. And the first thing we have to remember is that we all have the gift of hindsight. We know who Jesus was because we know the rest of the story. Now the disciples had seen the miracles, they'd heard Jesus' wonderful talks, they knew him as a great, charismatic, compassionate person, but they hadn't witnessed the crucifixion, or more importantly, the resurrection. They just didn't realize who he was. And I think Jesus was basically saying to them, you just don't get it, do you? But, in their defense, they were groping their way towards an understanding of exactly who he was. And it actually only comes up and, and finishes later in the next section of this gospel when Jesus says to Peter, who do you think I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah. I think a modern day Jesus would have gone, yes, they've got it at last. They've eventually got it. Now, I find these verses, though, very reassuring. Because the disciples were with Jesus all the time. They witnessed his miracles. They actually heard this man who could attract these huge crowds of people. They heard the parables, but they still struggled to realize who he was. So maybe we can sometimes be forgiven for struggling with faith. But let us remember that we do know the rest of the story and can share Peter's final recognition that Jesus was not some militant anti-Roman hero. He wasn't a deus ex machina dropped in from the clouds. But Jesus was, was a man well above humankind. A man among men, but akin to God. This Jesus is our light, our companion, our guide. This Jesus is God with us. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun shining down on me when the world's poor as it should be blessed be your name and blessed be your name on the roads marked with suffering and there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I'll Turn back to praise And when the darkness closes in, Lord Still I will say 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say. Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Oh yes, Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we bring our blessing to you because you alone are worthy. You are almighty God. You are the designer and creator of this universe, the manager of time, and yet you are our father too. You love each one of us equally. You've always loved us. You always will. You. And you have a purpose for our lives. And we thank you that you are there in every circumstance, every situation with each one of us because you love us so much. Thank you. Amen. Hello everyone on what is today Prison Sunday, the start of Prison Week of Prayer. This event is recognised by all major church denominations. If you'd like to know more or access resources about Prison Week, please go to the prisonweek.org website. That's prisonsweek, all one word, dot o-r-g. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name's Jenny Saunders and I've been volunteering at Lewis Prison for the last five years. And that started by um, me being at a held prayer meeting, a women's group that's held here. And I was moved during that prayer meeting to start to find out about working in prisons. And Prison Sunday is the absolutely perfect day to be launching our Christmas appeal for Angel Tree. Now you might wonder, what is Angel Tree? Well, at this church, we've been supporting Angel Tree, this potentially life-changing initiative for the last few years. So what is it, you may be asking? Well, it's a way of bringing joy into the lives of children whose parents are in prison. It involves sending presents at Christmas time to the children, and the outcomes have been very far-reaching. One story I'd like to tell you is Jessica's story. She received a teddy bear from her dad and a Christmas card written by him, and also a Christian book. And ever since then, every night, she's kissed that Christmas card goodnight, and re read the book with her mummy and loves the teddy bear to pieces. And it's really made the connection between her and her dad, who's now thankfully out and re reunited really well. So what do we do? Well, I work in Lewis Prison, and Lewis Prison, although it's, the Angel Tree is national, in Lewis Prison, we run our own initiative where we buy a present for each child, we wrap the present and we post it. And the total cost for each present is £20, including the Christian book, the dad's card, wrapping, postage. And how do we know what to buy? Well, the dads write on a form what the children like and write a message on the form to their child. Although this is a national scheme, as I said, we work very closely in Lewis with the prisoners, the 
prison chaplain and the, all the prison officers so that it's a very joined up initiative. But this year, it will be even more challenging than normal, obviously, because of COVID. It will be difficult with the wrapping because normally there's 15 or 20 of us in a house with hundreds of parcels everywhere. Obviously, this year, we'll be in individual homes. We'll probably be looking for help with buying and wrapping presents. But all, as well as being a challenge, like any situation, there's an opportunity. And that opportunity is because the men are locked up far more. So we're having to put the application forms under each cell door, meaning each man receives one. And what are the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve? Well, this helps keep families together or reunite them. It makes children happy at Christmas in helping families. We pray, most of all, that they will come to know the best present of all, the Lord Jesus. Now, you may be asking, how can you help? Well, obviously, prayer is underpinning all the work that we do, and that is vital. Um, but also, helping to give financially will be wonderful. Um, what happened last year was that um, we had envelopes and they were put in the collection that goes round. But I understand this year there will be a, a tray on your way out. So if you'd like to put cheques um, made per payable to myself, Jay Saunders, or if you'd like to put money in envelopes marked with angel tree. And in time, there will be some specific envelopes. Um, but from today, if you just want to put an envelope with angel tree on, that's fine. Um, last year, we, made, we collected for 140 presents, but this year, we're anticipating that there will be lots more needed. Um, there, as I said, there will be things on the website to look at. There's a particular one, Teresa's story, which um, is very moving. And uh, I just thank you for this time. And I just pray, Lord, now, in Jesus' name, that we pr can we just pray for this work and for all the men at Lewis Prison and their children. So, Father, we thank you for this wonderful ministry. We thank you for the way that you've mightily used it over the years. We thank you, Lord, for all the children that have been touched. And Lord, I thank you that you touch us by the little bits that we do and praise your name that we can be part of this work. And Lord, as we think of Prisons Week this week, we pray for the men at Lewis Prison, we pray for the prison officers, the governor, the chaplaincy, and Lord, at this time of such difficulty and so many confinements, we pray that these men and women at the prison who work there will be kept safe, and most of all, that your spirit will move in that place. We thank you for all the interest and all the help that people are actually asking for, and we thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that we receive. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
the sun I belong nation, we cry out to you in humility and ask forgiveness that you would come and heal this land because it has turned from you. Thank you, God. Now, shall we pray together for our world and our place in it? Father, at the present time, we seem to read and hear of almost nothing but the current pandemic and its effects on, in our own land. 
For some people, these effects can be serious, and we pray for all those who have suffered through illness, bereavement, isolation, and financial burdens. We pray that government will make good decisions and that local support systems will be able to respond to need. And now, in the privacy of your own home, maybe you'd like just to name out loud the people you think need prayer. We also pray, Father, that we might be more aware of worldwide needs. We pray for the people of Yemen and Syria who are hungry, homeless, traumatized by war, without any social structures to help them. Give courage, wisdom, and practical thoughts to all the aid agencies and their staff who are working in these areas. And please don't let us just sit back and forget about these people. We do earnestly pray that we may all, governments, agencies, and ordinary folk like us, work for a better world which is worthy of your name. Amen. And now may the Lord give us his blessing and all those whom you love now and forever. Amen. I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall not thirst. No one can come to me unless the Father
Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come to save the world, and you have raised me up, and you have raised me up, and you have raised me up on the 